In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of His blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And good morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I hope that you are very impressed with the graphics that I use in my sermons because my wife does the majority of my graphic design work. Sometimes it's from the ground up. Other times she'll take some idea that I have and she'll manipulate it and design it for the lesson. And um, so she, she helps me with the ministry in this way and in other ways as well. So now that you are in Mark, let's go to 1 Corinthians. But Mark is going to be our, our, our focal point for a while. <clears throat> We've been talking quite a bit about stewardship. And I even mentioned it a while ago in, in the Lord's Supper talk somewhat. Um, you know, that, that everything that we have belongs to God. It, it's, it's, it's God giving us something on, on loan, if you will, to, to use it and to manage it in a certain way, uh, to do the best that we can. Uh, we might be reminded of, of the master that was going to go on a trip and he gave his uh, employees some money. Uh, one of them went and invested it, and he got a return, and the other one invested, it, invested some, and he got some return. And the third one, he buried it, and he did that because he was afraid that his master, uh, or he was afraid that he might lose that money, and his master would be upset. And his master comes back, and he praises the two that invested that money and, and got something in return. But the last one, he was upset. He said, you, you are a foolish, a foolish person. I, I, I entrusted you with this money. You should, at the very least, put that money in the bank and earn some type of an interest. So the point illustrated there is that God has given us all kinds of talents, as Romans 12, verse 1 and following teach. But he's given us a lot, a lot of other things that aren't mentioned there, like our lives. Uh, he's given us our intellect. He's given us our, our homes. Everything that we have, He's given us. And He expects us to manage those things well. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 12, or verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is, a required, it is required of stewards 
that one be found trustworthy. Or another translation says, faithful. Now, faithful. At one time, when I was working myself through college, or working my way through college, I had a job at a Walmart in the cash office. And my, my job was to count all the monies, the cash, the coins, and the checks, coupons, and, and to make a deposit for the next day. And there were three shifts. And I had that shift that ended at, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And whenever there was only one person in the cash office, the tables were glass, and there were cameras all over the place so that everything that you did, I mean, it was, it was like, a, uh, like you see on TV, those casino cash rooms. There was no hiding of anything. Um, but it was time for my break. And I had bricks, bricks of money. It was during the Christmas season. And you can't leave any money on the table. You have to put everything in the safe. So I was putting all this money in the safe. I mean, I, I needed my break. I wanted my break. So I started uh, throwing the bricks, the bundles of money into the safe and then shut the safe and then called security. They came and unlocked the door, let me out. And then I came back. And when I started doing the deposit, $50,000 came up missing. 50000 I mean, that, that's, that's enough to send you to jail, isn't it? So the manager comes in. I reported. I, I just couldn't balance out. 50000 Now, you, you've been short a penny or two, but 50000 and uh, they start watching all the cameras. And they couldn't see me putting $50,000 in my pocket. They didn't see anything that, uh, that, that just was out of the ordinary. But what they did realize was that it was during my shift that $50,000 came up missing. And that I had not been a faithful or a trustworthy steward of that money. But I was innocent. So as the police came in to do an interview and the security was re-watching the video, they realized that when I was putting the money in or throwing the bundles in the safe, one of those bundles that was a $50,000 bundle went behind the safe. And that is a huge safe that is bolted in concrete. And the only way to get that money was to unbolt the safe. I, I, I didn't work in that department much longer. Paul is explaining to us that in order for me to be considered a good steward, I must be faithful. Now, what, steward in what aspect? Well, as, as I've already pointed out, in every aspect. Remember Joseph when he was in Potiphar's home? He was there as, as a slave. He didn't want to be there. He had been thrown into a dungeon. He had been sold off by his brothers. He, he was a, a child that was disliked by his own family. But now he finds himself in this position where he's been given the trust to take care, to manage all the ins and outs, the money, the food, everything of, of his master's house. So he was given the job as a steward. And, and it failed... Or it, it backfired when, when uh, Potiphar's wife uh, made sexual advances to, towards him and, and, and he said no and she, uh, you know, yelled rape, rape and you know, Joseph was back in prison. But, but everywhere Joseph was, when he was given a position uh, of, of management or authority, he always was faithful as a steward. Paul says that he was a faithful steward or a caretaker of the gospel. You know, I, I, I know that, that we talk a lot, or the scriptures mentions it, and therefore we talk a lot about elders and, and the decisions that they have to make. It, almost every Sunday, someone will mention in the prayer that we, th we thank you for, for our elders and the decisions that they have to make. And, you know, that is true, decisions that they have to make, but they're not making any decisions that are scriptural, I mean, because God has already legislated the word, so, so they're not making decisions on scriptural matters because it's already there. The decision has been made. They're making decisions on, on things that, uh, that, that affect all of us. But what they really are, are good stewards or stewards of the flock of God. 
They're managers. And what we ought to be praying is that God gives them the wisdom and that they have the courage to manage the household of God well. And preachers, we are caretakers of the gospel. We need to defend it. We need to preach it. We need to teach it to everyone as it has been delivered to us. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, uh, the entire section addresses fathers, wives, and children, the, the family unit. You know, fathers have been given the privilege, the honor of being the head of the household. Not the right, but the privilege and the honor. And as having that position, we need to be good stewards. Good stewards. I say to, to the young ladies that are, that are dating, looking for marriage, if the guy that you're dating uh, is lazy right now, doesn't mow the grass, uh, uh, is just a slob, and marriage isn't going to change him, it's probably going to make him worse. And that's how he's going to run the family. And that's how he's going to raise the kids. He sleeps till noon. Doesn't take a shower often. I mean, what, what are you doing with them? Fathers, you, you have a responsibility, right? To manage that household well, because it's been given to you, it's been entrusted to you, it's a privilege. And then... You know, we're stewards as employee employers. And then finally, Romans 13, uh, as citizens. In Genesis 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. Now, hopefully, when we get to Mark, eventually, you'll notice why I'm citing this one passage here in Genesis. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What would be the reason that God created us in his image? I mean, he created the horse and the dog and the pig, but he didn't create them in his image. Now, some might say well, in his image means that he gave them a soul, gave us a soul, but he didn't give the animals a soul. Is that it? Or is it that he created us in his image to be in the likeness, to be like God, to have a relationship and fellowship with him? That, that's it. So if God created us in his image, then we are to be like God or in his likeness. We're to be like him. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, as Christians, we have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So if we have been created in the image of God, and then Colossians here 3 verse 10, now, now that we've put on the new self, that, that we have left the world, and we're no longer of the world, that we are now the salt and the light of the world, that we put on Christ that we are now the image of the one who created us, then how should we behave? How should we manage or be a steward of that image? Well, we're going to concentrate for the rest of the study being a good steward with that image, with government. The... The discussion there in Mark 12, in verse 13, arises with the Pharisees and the Herodians conniving together to try to entrap Jesus. So it says that they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus in order to trap him in a statement. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you're not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. You, you, you know what, what, what all this is called, this, this first few lines here? You know, did, did the Pharisees and Herodians, did they like Jesus? Did they respect him? 
that they think he was smart, that they think he was holy, that they think he was a son of God? No. So they've just lathered this whole thing up because the intent was to trap Jesus. We know that you're smart. We know that you don't care what anyone thinks and that you're going to speak your mind. So is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Give me a half pence. Give me a denarius to look at. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness or image? Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now, the inscription on that coin was Caesar Tiberius, the son of the, the, son of the most divine Augustus. So that coin, very similar to our dollar bill, it says, In God we trust. But that coin, the inscription, the inscription on it was very idolatrous. Because it had the face of a man who believed, who claimed to be God himself. So Jesus says, let me see this coin and tell me, as he's doing the show and tell, whose likeness is it? And the inscription, they said, well, it's Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, well, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. How popular was Caesar among the Jews? That the Jews really love Caesar? You know, and it's interesting that, that here the, um, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they, they come together and use the poll tax as a way to test Jesus. First of all, the Pharisees, they hated everything Roman. Because the Romans had come and taken possession of J Jerusalem. And they were expecting a Messiah to come and kick out the Romans and destroy the Romans and set the Jews up as, as the world superpower. They, that, that's what they were hoping for. So they hated everything Rome, a Roman. The Herodians were loyal to the house of Herod. And remember Herod the Great, what did he do when Jesus was born? He had been convinced that he himself was the Messiah, that he was the king. And when he found out that Jesus was born and that the prophecy was that he would be king, he sent out all children, male children from two years and younger to be murdered. And the Herodians were loyal to the house of Herod. And Herod, his job was to pay the Romans taxes, but through his household. So I hope you can see that the Pharisees and the Herodians didn't like each other because the Herodians were charging taxes on behalf of Rome. They hated each other. But they had one common enemy, Jesus. And that brought them together to try to entrap Jesus. So they asked him, um, should we pay taxes or not? Well, you know, Jesus... Basically ask them, you know that money that you carry around in your pocket? Whose image is it? Whose image does it have on it? I said, well, Caesar. Now, you might not like the fact that you are living in an occupied area. You might not like the government. You might hate Caesar. You might despise who the governor is. You might despise the king. You might hate everything about the Roman rule, the Roman law, the Roman culture, the Roman everything. You hate it. But you carry his money in your pocket, don't you? You see where Jesus is headed with this? But also... In whose image have you been made? In God's image. So Jesus is getting to this point. We as Christians, as children of God, can coexist 
in government or with government. And we are required to be obedient and to render to Caesar what is Caesar's as long as we're rendering and being obedient to God. Now let's keep on looking at this. Some like to think that God and government are independent of each other. Some like to think that, you know, uh, uh, Peter said that I, I, I'd rather, you know, worship God instead of government or, or, or worship God before government. Peter didn't say that. You know, what Peter was getting at was if there's any law that gets in the way of me being a Christian, then I need to respect God's law first. So you must ask yourself, in this country that we live in, are there any laws that prohibit us, that get in the way of us, of worshiping God and exercising our religion? If there are none, then we need to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. But they're not independent of each other. As a matter of fact, the scriptures teach us otherwise. God is sovereign over all affairs, including the political affairs. This passage affirms that, that there are duties to governments that do not infringe on the ultimate duties to God. It, 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 is, it is wrong to assume that God is just sitting up in heaven with his arms crossed, letting things just happen without him being involved. Remember the discussion that Habakkuk had with God? God, how much longer must my eyes see all of this unrighteousness? Your people, your, your children, they, they are just terrible people, so immoral, so unrighteous. I can't stand it. And God says, wait a second. I've been working on a plan that if anybody had told it to you, you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to raise up these terrible, nasty uh, people that, that, that you hate so much, and I'm going to use them to punish. So God was working the political affairs of the world, wasn't he? To do what? To punish his own children using wicked people. So while we might not like who our leaders are, and we might say that they're godless and that they're terrible and that they're nasty, God is still involved in these political affairs, isn't he? And he's using them for whatever his purpose might be. What is our job as Christians? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And unto God what is God's. But keep in mind that God is always, God is always in control of the world. Now, we might wish that we could serve as a consultant to God and tell him how to better run the world. But God has something that we don't have. He has a benefit of eternity. All we can do is see right here. God doesn't listen to CNN and Fox. God is omniscient. He knows it all. Romans 13, verse 1, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, this might come, uh, this might uh, arise a question in your minds like, well, if there is no authority that exists but that from God, if there's no government that has been, that, that is in place but that from God, well, what about the governments like Mussolini out in, in Italy, uh, uh, or, or, or the communists in China, or those governments that murder their people, what does the scripture say here? I didn't make it up. What does it say? It says what it says and it means what it means. There is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. 
And do you want to have no fear of, of, of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. It is a minister, that is the authority, the rulers. It is a minister of God to you, or f- to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now, this idea of sword, it does not carry or wield the sword in vain, I believe. It's talking about this gives the government authority to punish evildoers, even to the extent of capital punishment. But that could be another study some other time. Verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. But notice this, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Whose conscience do you think Paul is talking about here? The world's conscience or the Christian's conscience? It's our conscience. Why? Because we have been made in the image of God, and we have been transformed and renewed to be the image of the one that has purchased us. Verse 6, For because of this also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoted themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due, whether it tax, or custom, or fear, or honor. Now, if I was to dissect this passage and outline it some, I might say something to the effect, do I as an American agree where all my tax dollars are spent? No. But do I pay those taxes? Yes, because if I don't, what's going to happen? Nobody wants to be in the pokey. Do I honor all those that are in leadership position? Probably not. But why do I do the first one and not the last one? The first one is because there's an immediate consequence. You cannot hide from the IRS. Let me tell you that right now. The last one, we've been given liberties, right? Freedom of speech where we can say some nasty things about our political leaders and get away with it. But eventually we're going to be asked to give an account for those words, aren't we? So no, we're not going to get away with it. So the point is that we have to do all of these things here. Not just one because I'll be in jail if I don't do it, but all of them. And I'm not saying it's easy. Some years it's easier than others. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men for kings, for those that are in authority, For what purpose? For what purpose should we pray for dictators? Having preached in countries that are socialist and religion is illegal. My prayer for their kings and their rulers is that one day they will come to the knowledge of the gospel of Christ. And that their hearts will be changed. So that the Christians will no longer have to worship God in hiding but have the free exercise thereof. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. You know why Paul says this is good and acceptable? To avoid or to stop us from saying, well, yeah, God, we ought to pray for the kings and we ought to pray for the rulers, but only the ones that I like, only the ones I voted for. And Paul say, no, no, look, this is good and acceptable, really. If you just think about this, think about the reasoning. I'm asking you to do this not because of what political party you belong to or what clan is in there or what family dynasty is ruling. I'm asking you to do this for this reason. For the propagation and proclamation of the gospel. Because you need to forget that while that coin in your hand has the image of Caesar, your soul has the image of God. And that's what matters the most. The image of God stamped on your soul. 
Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator, and also, uh, one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, for who, gave, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Submit yourself, says Peter. And I want you to think about how difficult it must have been, or maybe not difficult, but how of a humbling experience it must have been for Peter to write these words later on in his apostleship. Second Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom to, as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves to God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So, again, how humbling do you think it must have been for Peter to finally, or when he wrote this, to say, honor the king, honor the rulers, respect, from a man that early on in his ministry, there in Mark chapter 8, was told by Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Why did Jesus say to Peter, get behind me, Satan? Because the authorities had come, the authorities with false accusations, the authorities that, that were so, so corrupt, to falsely arrest and to bring false witnesses that have been bribed, and to use their political clout to force a hand of the governor, uh, of, of Pilate, to murder Jesus. It was all a farce. It was all illegal from the beginning to the end. And Peter didn't like that. It's not fair. It's not fair. And what did Jesus say? Stop. And get behind me. Why? Because the only thing Peter could understand at that moment was what he could see. And what Jesus could understand was what Peter couldn't see. The gospel plan of salvation. The devil was already causing chaos, wasn't he? And the devil loves confusion, doesn't he? And you just think about our political climate right now. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of hurt feelings, right? You think the devil's happy with that? And here's another one. Among us Christians who hold different political views and opinions, some of us aren't talking to each other right now. You think the devil's happy with that? Ooh, you better believe it. We might hold the image of the king in our pockets, but never forget that we hold the image of God on our souls. So learn to be a good steward of the government, but a better steward of your soul. And while Peter couldn't understand it at that moment, he later understood it when he wrote his first epistle. Yes, yeah, submit yourself to every form of government. So I'll leave you with these thoughts here. How is it that we can be a good steward of government? Well, we've read scripture already. It says pray, right? Pray, making treaties for all those that are kings, rulers, everyone that's in authority. What's the reason that we ought to pray for those that are in authority? What's the reason? so that they will not hinder the preaching of the gospel. That's, that's a reason. And again, we're living in some very tumultuous times that, that we, will, we will say like, like, like the Apostle Paul, might not that Lord come quickly. But power shifts every four years in this country, doesn't it? Every six years in Mexico, every 250 years in Russia, depending on how long that dictator's going to live. Power shift. 
so pray for our soldiers, for the first responders, police, and but you know, here's something else: be a good influence. Remember that we are Christians. We are Christians. Somebody had once said years ago, um, William Jeff- Jefferson Clinton was, a, was president then. And a Christian said, if I saw President Clinton on the side of the road with a flat tire and having a heart attack, I wouldn't stop to help him. Well, come on now. That statement is wrong on so many levels, isn't it? On so many levels. And we should vote. Because this is one way that we as Christians can influence, right? But above all, let's be peaceful. Which means that we don't need to be standing in a picket line. We don't need to be throwing rocks, literally or metaphorically. We don't need to be destroying things. So first of all, Paul, uh, Peter, uh, Paul says, I urge that entreaties and prayers be made on behalf of all those who lead us. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, As Christians, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And attend to your own business. What does this passage mean in modern day lay terms? Mind your own business. And don't make too big of a fuss. That's what it's saying, isn't it? Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and tend to your own business and work with your hands just as we have commanded you. And then the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And make sure that you live that way. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Verse 16, the last part of verse 15 says, uh, we know that we live in this crooked and perverse generation. He says, but you, the Christians, among whom you appear as lights in the world, by holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, or toil in vain. One of the sections in, in the workbooks, if you're following along, asks the question, well, may a Christian then serve in the military? May a Christian run for political office? May a Christian, you know, serve as president? Well, there, there are scriptural examples where that happened. But let me caution you first, if you want to be a politician, your integrity is going to be questioned all the time. And you're going to be, depending on what, what, which office, right, you're going to be approached and offered bribes. And, uh, you, you know, just, just think about those that are in power right now. Do, do we think that of them as being honest or dishonest? But yes, uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 23, talks about the conscience. If your conscience allows you to do that, to serve in the military, to, to serve in political office, then you may do so. Uh, Joseph, in Genesis 41, is an example. He served as the second in command, as viceroy of the entire Egyptian uh, government. Daniel served under the worst king. But he did so respecting his conscience, didn't he, and respecting God. Never gave in when the king said, I want you to drink, I want you to eat, I want you to do all these things that, that we do in our culture. And he said, no, I cannot violate my conscience. I cannot sin against God. And Cornelius was a soldier. So let's look at your questions rather quickly. Government evolved solely by the will and intent of man. True or false? Yeah, it's false. I mean, these are so easy, aren't they? God has little to do with... Uh, God has little to do with who rules a nation. False. False. The New Testament forbids Christians to interact with government. False. We are to pray for the government. That was not an option, but 
Yes. <laughs> All right, Proverbs 14, 34. What is it? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach or disgrace to any people. Romans uh, 13, 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from... And those which exist are, yes, appointed or established by God. Acts 5.29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must, rather than men. That's right. And uh, one more. Philippians 2 verse 15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights of the world. Thank you and God bless. Hallelujah praise Jehovah from the heavens praise his name praise Jehovah in the highest all his angels praise proclaim all his hosts together praise him Son and moon stars on high. Praise you, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory Things and beasts and cattle.